It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This government has refused to listen to people on Ontario Works and ODSP who are being legislated into deep poverty. The NDP invited social assistance recipients to a roundtable to share their experiences with the Premier and the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. So we've brought their voices to the House in a report which was delivered to the Minister and to the Deputy Premier this morning. The stories that people shared are profoundly heartbreaking and enraging, like Trevor, who only gets to eat one meal a day, or Declan, who wasn't able to get a haircut before going to his mother's memorial service. Will the Premier listen to Ontarians, double the rates, and ensure that everyone in Ontario can live a healthy, dignified life? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. I think it's always important to hear from citizens, Ontarians, about their life experiences, and that's why our government has made a decades, uh, a, a historic investment in, in ODSP. It is historic. Largest increase in decades. And we've indexed that to inflation. Never been done before in Ontario's history. And we've raised the threshold and, and created an earnings exemption that we quadrupled from 200 to uh, well quintupled from $200 a month to $1,000 a month. These are all measures that we're taking to help people who can work, but we're also helping people who can't work. And we're continuing to use a multi-ministry, a cross-government effort, uh, the micro-credentialing pro programs, the mental health programs, the child care benefits, the lift and Response. care tax credits, the minimum wage. These are all things that we have done to improve the lives of, of citizens across Ontario, particularly those who are vulnerable and dependent on, on support from government. But we're enabling people, creating a meaningful, purposeful employment and, and filling the jobs that exist today, putting them back into... Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question, member for Ottawa West, McKean. What is clear, Speaker, is that legislating Ontarians into deep poverty is having profoundly negative effects on their physical health, their mental health, and their emotional well-being. Tracy has to live on egg salad sandwiches or spaghetti for weeks on end because that's all she can afford on $80 a month. Jordan has to skip meals to provide for his daughter and can no longer afford to pay for her swimming lessons. The minister can throw around the word historic all she wants. What's clear is the results. People are suffering. Will the government listen to their voices and double the rates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And once again, I appreciate uh, the question from the, the uh, member opposite. You know, if, if the member opposite won't take my word for the real improvement we're making in people's lives, I would suggest you listen to those who provide services <laughs> and supports every day. Uh, this is great news for people receiving ODSP as the employment income threshold will have a huge positive impact for them. Thank you to the Government of Ontario for your ongoing support. That's from Brad Saunders, Chief Executive Officer, Community Living Ontario. We, we are pleased with the announcement. This means more money in the pockets of the people we support, as well as improving their quality of life. We thank the Government of Ontario for their continued support. That's Valerie Pichet, Chair of the Board, Community Living Toronto. This announcement is a signal from the government that they are listening. This is a definite step in the right direction. We look forward to continuing our work with the government. Chris Beasley, Response. CEO of Community Living Ontario. A game changer and a change in a very, very significant way. Mark Wafer, interim CEO of the Ability Centre. We're making positive change. Speaker. Thank you. And the final supplementary, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. Participants in the NDP's roundtable who have disabilities shared that they'd love to be working, but they can't because of their disability. Parents who are full-time caregivers for children with disabilities are forced to live on Ontario Works, unable even to buy diapers or other supplies for their children because the rates are so low. This government's policies are forcing people with disabilities to live in deep poverty. But as Paul, an ODSP recipient, said, quote, becoming disabled can happen to anyone. It could happen to you. 
Why is the government making people with disabilities live in poverty instead of doubling the rates? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is taking the measures necessary after decades of neglect by the previous opposition and the NDP. Speaker, it was the Liberals who had the chance to raise rates, and in fact, they waited until they were about to lose an election to even suggest it. The NDP had a chance Order. to make it a priority when they propped up the Liberals for three years while they chose to sit on the sidelines and didn't make it an issue. And while they talked, it was our government that acted. My Order. You know, I, I, I just find it incredible, the, the investments that we're making that you could have done and you never did. You, you, you abandoned it order. when you could have done it. We made the Opposition investments in order. social assistance, and we're investing again. We're indexing rates to inflation. We've made historic Spons. raises. We're calling on the federal government to commit to their promise of a Canada disability benefit. We're continuing to make the necessary changes to support people. Thank you very much. Remind the members to please make their comments to the chair. The next question, the leader of the of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The verdict is in on this government's so-called housing plan, and it's damning. Mayors, councils, experts, and community groups are all united against Order. the so-called plan. Bills 23 and 39 are undemocratic. They will financially devastate municipalities. They're harmful to the environment, and they won't build the homes that people need. Yes. Will this government finally listen to Ontarians and repeal Bill 23 and withdraw Bill 39 before it's too late? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Okay, Speaker. So the, the Leader of the Opposition talked about democracy. Which so Which so here's a party that has essentially an acclamation uh, for their leader. They've got like a Castro-esque <laughs> ballot that's going to be uh, available in March one with one state. name on the ballot. I'm going to caution the member on his language. Minister, please conclude your answer. Even that, Speaker, even with that, only 27%—you want to talk about democracy? Only 27% of that caucus, only eight members out of 30, could oh even do a public declaration Whoa. in favour of the acclaimed new leader. Oh I'm not going to take any like lessons from the 30 New Democrats in this House about Months? democracy. We're going to continue to stand up for young families. We're going to continue to be there for newcomers to Ontario, and we're going to continue to stand up for seniors that want a safe city. Stop the clock. Just pause for a second. We start the clock. Supplementary question. Member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The government has said it is looking at continuing its assault on democratic norms by bringing strong mayor powers to more regions, including Halton, Durham, Niagara, Peel, Waterloo and York. We do not have to sacrifice democratic norms to address our housing crisis. Instead of doubling down on minority rule, can your government withdraw Bill 39 immediately? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, you know, New Democrats uh, can't build homes. They're a uh, house divided in the <laughs> legislature. You know, I I'm not sure what that member and her party has against fantastic regional chairs like Nando Inisi in Peel, Wayne Emerson in York, and Jim Bradley in Niagara. You know, I want to work with those three chairs. I want to work with the other three elected chairs when we appoint a facilitator and when we do, as our Premier has said many times, we want to make sure that mayors have the tools to get shovels in the ground faster. The extension of strong mayor powers in Bill 39 does exactly that, Speaker. Yeah. Bill Supplementary, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. The minister and this government can spin it as they like, but the facts remain, Speaker. Bill 39 undermines democracy, it undermines environmental protection, and it does nothing to provide affordable housing. 
It also undermines locally elected councillors. And I know there are multiple Scarborough councillor uh, MPPs here whose counterparts, the, um, the councillors in those regions, were some of the signatories in the letter that was recently sent out to the Premier to reconsider Bill 39 because they haven't even gotten a chance to sit down and have a meeting about Bill 39 sure. because this government spent last night ramming through it. So, Speaker, my question is, has the Premier and this Minister of Municipal Affairs listened to some of the Scarborough members on his side, especially the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility Affairs? Thank you very much. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I can assure the honourable member that on the government side, the members from Scarborough are standing up for that young family. Here, here, here. And welcoming, here, they're here. welcoming new Canadians to come to our province here, here. and to live in Scarborough. But we have one problem, Speaker. What? One problem that New Democrats stand in front of every single solitary time, and that's building more housing here, of here. every type, of every shape, of every size, and every price range. Transit, it's too. the members from Scarborough that are standing up for the people of Scarborough. Here, here, here. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In Durham, there is a layer of protection around the Green Belt called the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act. This Premier is peeling it back in Bill 39. The Minister's public justification was a letter from the former Mayor of Pickering. However, late the other night, Pickering City Councillors unanimously decided they don't support the repeal of the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act. The Minister of, Mu of Municipal Affairs and Housing has no justification for removing the ag preserve protections from the Greenbelt, and now he doesn't have the support of council. Will the Premier let the member for Pickering Uxbridge side with his community, abandon his assault on the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve, and choose to protect prime farmland in perpetuity as promised? Mr. Well, Speaker, I, I want to assure members of this House, I want to assure people in Pickering and Uxbridge that you're not going to find a bigger champion uh, to have uh, Ontarians realize the home ownership than our Minister of Finance, Peter Beckenfeld. He is unwavering in his commitment, as we all are uh, on the government side. We looked Ontarians in the eye during the election and said we were going to put a plan in place to build 1.5 million come to order. over the next 10 years. We also realized that with the order. federal government's new immigration targets, we're going to have an extra 500,000 people uh, coming to our country. 60 per cent of them are going to come order. to the GTA. We need to ensure that we've got a plan in place and looking at areas like this one that former Mayor Ryan more really aptly uh, articulated as a site that's been talked about for over 20 years. The conversation around this, this property preceded the creation of the Greenbelt. Uh, and, and I can tell you something, we're going to continue to put policies in place that get shovels in the ground to build those one. Thank you. And the supplementary, the member for Ottawa West Virginia. Back to the Premier. It's not just Pickering City Council that voted against Bill 39. Last week, Ottawa's new City Council voted unanimously in support of a motion condemning Bill 39 and its attack on democracy. Ottawa residents are furious that this government is trampling on basic democratic principles, imperiling affordable housing, destroying wetlands, and costing our city millions of dollars with its Bills 23 and 39. My question to the Premier, does the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services stand behind those bills or does she stand with her constituents, the people of Ottawa? Well, Speaker, in response to the municipal comments made about Bill 23, Dr. Rob Gillizzo has also said, quote, it's disappointing, but not surprising to see municipalities come so hard against one of the most effective pieces uh, to lower prices in Ontario's new housing, um, new housing legislation. The members opposite should be very familiar with uh, Dr. Gillizzo. He's an accredited economist, but he also works as a policy advisor to the future oh. leader of the NDP. Oh. <laughs> 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 
The next question, order, member for Mississauga Streetsville. Good morning, Speaker, and thank you. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Last week, the minister was in India to engage with business leaders and promote Ontario at the Indo-Canadian Business Chamber's annual convention in New Delhi. This was an opportunity to strengthen relationships with the economic partners and continue attracting investments in the manufacturing, technology and life sciences sector. We can all agree that our government must continue to ensure Ontario has a strong and competitive tech ecosystem, whilst also ensuring that there are plenty of good jobs for individuals and families across this province. Speaker, will the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade please update the House on his trade mission to India? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Since we've been out sharing the message how Ontario is open for business, we've been hearing interesting messages coming back. Speaker, in a world filled with turmoil, companies see Ontario as a beacon, a sea of calm, a reliable, trusted partner, a place they can locate their business. While in Mumbai, 88 Pictures, an animation and media entertainment company, announced Ontario as the location for their first international expansion. Working with our great partner Toronto Global, 88 Pictures will hire 150 professionals starting in the new year. They told us that Ontario has everything they need to succeed and proves that Ontario is open for business. So please welcome us in joining 88 Pictures to Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is evident that our government attending the Indo-Canadian Business Convention was timely in advancing Ontario as a competitive place for businesses to invest and grow. In an increasingly globalized world, Ensuring good working relationships with the world's strongest economies is more important than ever. As the Minister correctly stated, Ontario must continue to promote itself as a great place to do business. Speaker, can the Minister elaborate further on the positive outcomes and future opportunities Ontario can expect due to our trade mission in India? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, our mission to India was also an opportunity to personally thank the many companies who located in Ontario because of our previous missions. We met with LTTS, they just opened in Markham, HCL, they now have 1,500 employees in Mississauga, Tata Consultancy Services, they just announced 5,000 new, uh, new hires, and Zoho, who just opened in the town of Cornwall. We also met with leading companies like SR, ITC, Infotech. Tata Alexi, and up-and-comers like Pinkasho and Whitseal Technologies, all leading Indian companies looking to locate worldwide. They're fully aware that Ontario is the number two tech cluster in all of North America. 20,000 tech companies, 400,000 employees, 65,000 STEM grads, all part of our world-class ecosystem. Speaker, that's our competitive edge. That's why Response. companies from around the world continue to locate in Ontario. Sure. Next question, a member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. In its response to the government's proposed repeal of the Duffins Rouge Agriculture Preserve Act, Park Canada warns, Parks Canada warns, and I quote, there is a probable risk of irreversible harm to wildlife, natural ecosystems, and agriculture landscapes within Rouge National Urban Park, thereby reducing the viability and functionality of the park's ecosystems and farmland, end of quote. Parks Canada also says that the provincial government has failed to meet its obligations under its binding agreement with Parks Canada respecting the Rouge National Urban Park. Why is the minister going so far out of his way to violate so many agreements and break so many promises. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as everyone in this house knows, and as we've talked about over and over again, 
It is this government's intention to build 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years. And frankly, the federal government's opinion on this is somewhat misguided. The park is not attached to Duffins Rouge. And we know, Mr. Speaker, we know that protections will be in place as we go forward as home builders build these homes that we desperately need, that conservation measures will still be in place, that wetland evaluations will still play take place. Mr. Speaker, there's an opportunity to solve a problem here. We're taking that opportunity. We need to take that opportunity. We will take that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. A supplementary question, the member for Kiewetnaw. Our uh, question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, it's been very clear. This government does not prioritize Indigenous rights. The failure to engage in dialogue with the rights holders about the duty to consult and accommodate makes Bill 23 unlawful at worst and undemocratic at best. Why doesn't just why doesn't just this, that this government just say that their housing plan is more important than upholding Indigenous rights? Why don't you just come out and say that, you know, you do not care about Indigenous rights? Miigwech. Mr. Northern Affairs and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It may surprise the member that I don't see it that way, and neither does our government. We have a pressing and substantial challenge that we're turning into an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, and that is to build 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years. We know, Mr. Speaker, that across this problem, our province, housing shortages are real. They're real for families living in municipalities, in, in big cities, and in Indigenous communities, Mr. Speaker. That's why we will move ahead with a balanced approach to build 1.5 million homes in 10 years, to work with our Indigenous communities and their leadership to ensure the housing opportunities are, are, are there for them as well, Mr. Speaker. That's what we're hearing uh, from them, and that's what we intend to pursue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. Uh, under the previous Liberal government, our transportation infrastructure system urg urgently needed investment. Unfortunately, uh, this neglected, uh, these neglected, like profoundly impacted roads, safety, and many in Northern and Indigenous communities. For many, I mean. Uh, Communities in Northern Ontario face unique challenges and need our government support for safe and reliable roadways. Uh, particularly in the North, uh, winter uh, weather conditions can make driving on roads even more challenging. Speaker, can the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development please inform the House about our government plan to improve access and safety for people traveling across Northern Ontario? Minister of Northern Affairs. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell for his question and his great advocacy on behalf of his constituents. His interest in this matter, Mr. Speaker, is timely. You know, just because winter's coming doesn't mean that a government shouldn't be well underway in a, building a robust winter roads program. Uh, for Northern Ontario. This serves 24,000 residents, Mr. Speaker, across Ontario's far north. My ministry recently announced more than $6 million for the next fiscal year to continue supporting the construction and operation of a 3,170-kilometer temporary winter road system, Mr. Speaker. These investments link 32 isolated First Nations communities and the town of uh, Moosonee together to the provincial highway network. This improves the health, social, and economic prospects and much needed supplies to serve those communities and forms the basis, Mr. Speaker, for important corridors in the future to serve these communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it's excellent to hear that our government is determined to support workers in Northern Ontario. Northern Ontario communities are diversified, not just geographically. The needs of uh, Northern communities and Indigenous support uh, in, 
companies and businesses and their different needs. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs can tell her more about what the government is doing to support communities in the north. Mr. Northern Development. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, in Northern Ontario, we are making target investments to uh, make francophone communities more dynamic and with uh, um, the Heritage Fund uh, Corporation, we invested many, much money in more than 10 projects, for example, in Hearst, where there's an investment, not just in community institutions, but also a, a francophone tourist strategy. In Collège Boreal, we invested in essential infrastructures on the campus. And in French River, with the public school board in the, of the Great North, we have a, a community development fund and center. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. All of Toronto City Council opposes the government using Bill 23 to carve up the Greenbelt. A majority of Council is against Bill 39, imposing minority rule on the people of Toronto, including councillors from Etobicoke. Thousands of Etobicoke residents have signed petitions calling on the government to withdraw both bills. Premier, have the members of the Etobicoke ridings shared the concerns of their local councillors and constituents and advocated for them with you? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, the members uh, from Etobicoke support Mayor Tory, and they want to give Mayor Tory, who received a strong citywide democratic mandate on October 24th, they want him to have the tools to get the job done to be able to make sure that he does his share of the 1.5 million homes we need to build by 2031. Uh, my question back to the members from the City of Toronto, from the New Democratic Party, is why don't you support Mayor Tory? Why, don't you, why are you not supporting measures that Mayor Tory needs to help with our su housing supply uh, action plan? The members to make their comments to the chair. Supplementary, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Bill 23 will have devastating consequences for Brampton, including massive tax hikes, a reduction of parkland, and a lack of affordable housing, to name a few. It has been reported that, quote, the city anticipates if Bill 23 is approved based on the loss of revenue from development charges, cash in lieu of parkland, and additional infrastructure hits, it can expect to lose approximately $440 million. To make up this lost revenue without a corresponding increase to provincial grant funding, it would require an 80 percent increase to the current property tax rate for homeowners. Uh, homeowners end quote. Through you, Speaker, Premier, has the President of the Treasury Board told you whether he thinks it's fair that seniors and families in his riding could face a massive tax hike of up to 80 per cent. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, that's just Speaker, those, those numbers don't that's add ridiculous. up, but you know what does add up? The comments from Dr. Gillizzo, who said, you're arguing for, here's his quote, you're yeah. arguing for the exact policy agenda that has prioritized existing homeowners at the expense of young people and newcomers. He also argued that the opposition's criticism of Bill 23 is too focused on a populist narrative and forgets about, quote, important implications wow. for housing supply, <laughs> housing that? prices, and inequality. You know, the opposition talks a, a good game, but here's their own NDP policy person, wow. Dr. Gillisau, arguing against oh the policy that's Order. just yeah, articulated. Get your facts straight. Yeah. Order. Stop the call. Order. Again, I'll remind the members to please make their comments through the chair. <laughs> Member for Brampton North will come to order. <laughs> it's usually you.
Start the clock. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. On August 31st, I asked the Minister why the reconstruction of the Argyle Street Bridge in Caledonia was being held up. I appreciated the Minister's response that the reconstruction is a top priority for this government. Speaker, the Minister also spoke about the need for due diligence on a laundry list of tasks that need to be undertaken before reconstruction can begin. Tasks, I believe, had already been completed prior to my question in August. Speaker, I'm in Caledonia often, but I'm not there every single day, like the people who live there, like the people who own businesses, and they tell me there's been no work done on the bridge over the past three months. Speaker, the people of Caledonia, the people of Haldeman County would appreciate an update from this government what due diligence is still required before shovels are put in the ground. So should Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and appreciate the question from the member opposite this morning. No government has taken the transportation infrastructure investments more seriously than this government. In fact, we're talking about $80 billion in improving roads, improving transit for the people of this province, because we realize, Speaker, that after 20 years of neglect from the NDP and Liberals, we're playing catch-up, and we have a growing population. In fact, record growth is on the way to this province, 30 per cent growth over the next decade alone. Speaker, that means that we need to prepare for that future. There is a process, however, and I am glad to highlight for the member this uh, morning that that process involves important environmental assessments consultation with ind Indigenous communities, and in the case of bridges, where necessary, if expropriation is necessary, all of the due diligence that is required for that speaker, as well as consultations with local business uh, and municipalities. It is a process. It is a process that is being followed, but unlike the last government, we're doing it, and we're doing it quickly. Well Supplementary question. Speaker, I firmly believe all the due diligence that the member opposite speaks about has been done. The only thing that hasn't been done is the reconstruction. And I've had reporters ask me, why the secrecy in the ministry? Why the stalling? The Argyle Street Bridge in Caledonia serves both local and commercial vehicles. And the ministry imposed a weight limit on the bridge some time ago, and I believe the ministry is collecting fines on anyone who exceeds that limit. I'd love to know how much money the ministry has raked in. This century-old bridge collapsed in 1925, and I'm fearful that a bridge deemed to be in a state of deterioration in 2001 will be another headline at some time. Speaker, when I asked my original question in August, the minister pointed the finger at the previous government for not taking action, and we all know what happens when you point the finger. And yet today, we see the member opposite pointing the finger again. Question. This government has had four years to begin reconstruction on that bridge, and all that's happened is a woman has been kicked out of her home on the north side. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the date the people of Caledonia can expect the bridge to begin reconstruction? The associate minister. Well, Speaker, a, a curious tone from the member opposite, and notice that they're cheered on by the Liberals, who in fact were the ones who ignored these types of in investments in the first place, Speaker. So you want me to point a finger? Well, let me point a finger at 2022, 2023's number, $1.7 billion to expand and repair Southern Ontario's highways and bridges, which will not only fix the issues that the member is speaking about, but create over 11,000 jobs in Southern Ontario alone, Speaker. Speaker, the reality is, after years, decades, in fact, of neglect by the Liberals who are, for some bizarre reason, heckling this uh, question this morning, we are taking action and investing in this province, not just for today, but for generations Order. to come. We're going to get the job done. The next question, the member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, in my riding of Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, and across our province, many Ontarians are looking I, uh... to join the workforce. However, those with prior involvement in the criminal justice system often face barriers to finding work. As Ontario continues to address our most significant labour shortage in a generation, our government must provide the necessary tools for individuals looking to gain secure employment. Speaker, can the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development please share with this House what our government is doing to empower individuals helping them to get a second chance. The Minister of Labour, Immigration and Skills Development. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound for that question and for advocating uh, every single day at Queen's Park on behalf of his constituency. 
Uh, speaker, our government is helping people realize their dreams and build better lives for themselves and their families. It's easy to pigeonhole people who have criminal records for a single mistake they made when they were much younger. Mr. Speaker, in Canada, 4 million people have criminal records, 10 per cent of the population, and they shouldn't be held back after doing their time for their entire lives. It's time to break the, uh, the stigma. Second chance hiring breaks a cycle of poverty and incarceration. Mr. Speaker, to build a stronger Ontario, we have to, we must lift more people up. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. I'm glad we're giving people a second chance to build a better life here in Ontario. As we work towards reducing barriers for those seeking to enter and re-enter the workforce, it is crucial to prepare job seekers with the skills they need to succeed in the workplace. Speaker, my question is once again to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. What is our government doing to help train individuals with the skills and knowledge they need to succeed? Minister of Labour. I want to thank the member again for this uh, very important question. A speaker, no matter where you come from, what your education level is, or who you know, our government wants to help you get the skills you need to succeed. That's why, in the latest round of our Skills Development Fund, we're prioritizing projects helping those with prior involvement with the criminal justice system. Speaker, our fund is helping people of all ages, education levels, and backgrounds get the skills they need to be successful in life. If you're able to work, we need you. And if you want to work, we're ready to give you a shot at a better life. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, last week, after the government doubled down claiming that Waterloo Region municipalities were sitting on over $200 million of reserve funds from development charges, in fact, it was reported that the legislation, Bill 23, will cost the region $530 million over 10 years, according to regional staff. Waterloo Mayor McCabe said the bill's reduction in development charges could leave the city short $23 million to $31 million. That's money used to pay for roads, sewers, transit, libraries, and other city services. And now the taxpayers will have to foot that bill. Does the minister know whether the member from Kitchener-Conestoga now regrets his support for Bill 23 now that they know it was based on faulty information and will harm our Order. community's ability to build housing and infrastructure. Question. It's a destructive. Order. 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 The House will come to order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, to reply. Just more mendacious propaganda that the opposition continues to speak about in the in the House. The I thought you said audacious, but you said mendacious. You have to withdraw. <laughs> Withdraw, Speaker. You know, Speaker, municipalities already do much of what Bill 23 will legislate. Numerous municipalities have existing DC or property tax incentive programs to incur or encourage infill development or to help contribute to affordable housing. They include Kitchener. Ah. They include Barrie, Cambridge, Peterborough, Halton Hills, Brampton, Niagara Falls, many, many others. In fact, Toronto has provided $195 million in D.C. exemptions between 2018 and 2021 through the Toronto Open Door Program. And the other Once. municipality that the member knows is Hamilton her former leaders community, who has provided $242 million wow. in D.C. exemptions between 20... Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Hamiltonians are tired of this government not listening to them. Our city council voted to hold the urban boundary, but this government has disregarded and disrespected this. Hamiltonians have been protesting the passage of Bill 23 since the beginning, but the local minister and the local member have chosen not to listen to their communities and voted for it anyways. It is clear Hamiltonians are not happy. They know this move will lead to sprawl, 
unaffordable housing and car dependent cities. Can the minister tell the ho this House if the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport and the member from Flamborough Glanbrook have shared with them there are cities opposition to Bill 23? Speaker, I've said many times in the House that when it comes to Hamilton, that council went against their own planning department's projections. They couldn't have it both ways. They can't uh, not want to expand the urban boundary, but then also not want to intensify within the urban core. They can't have it both ways. You know, again, Speaker, I, I didn't have enough time to get this on the record, but again. When it comes to Bill 23, municipalities like the City of Hamilton do exactly what the bill is proposing. Hamilton's provided, Speaker, $242 million in D.C. exemptions between 2013 and 2021 for both residential and non-residential development. All Bill 23 does is codifies exactly what Hamilton uh, Council here, here. already does. Here, here. Next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Great. The COVID-19 pandemic left many families across Ontario dealing with significant challenges. Sadly, domestic violence incidents increased during this period for many women in our province. In my own community, in 2021, Halton Police responded to 3,500 intimate partner violence-related calls. Yesterday, December 6, was the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. On this day, we honour and remember the 14 young women killed and the 13 other individuals injured at L'Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal 33 years ago. It is also a day that we remember countless other women and girls who are victims and survivors of gender-based violence. Speaker, can the minister provide an update Question. to this House on the government's work to address gender-based violence? Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, and commend her work to recently pass a private member's motion to further the important work to end intimate partner violence by offering continuous education courses to those involved in family court systems. This motion builds on our absolutely. This motion builds on our government's many actions to address gender-based violence. And Speaker, last year alone, we invested 11 million in violence prevention initiatives and nearly 200 million in the services and wraparound supports for the survivors of violence. And I recently had the opportunity to visit the 707 Hub, which ho hosts Rose of Durham, Catholic Family Services of Durham, Luke's Place, and Driven. And they are a hub that focuses on addressing post-separation violence, trauma-informed supportive counseling, and specialized safety planning while leveraging its legal expertise Spons. in the delivery of legal support, legal aid assistance, and court preparation and accompaniment. Women are supported, and when they are supported like 707 Hub, they can break free and end the generational cycle of trauma for themselves and their children. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for her response. I want to express my sincere gratitude to the frontline professionals who support and comfort survivors of domestic and sexual violence. This is difficult and important work, and sadly, it is often unrecognized. I'm encouraged that Ontario endorsed the 10-year National Action Plan to End Gender-Based Violence. This national plan is a solid framework that will ensure reliable and timely access to protect and assist anyone facing gender-based violence. Speaker, can the minister address how Ontario will implement the National Action Plan? The Associate Minister. Thank you again to the member of Oakville North Burlington for the question. I am proud that our government endorsed the release of Canada's first National Action Plan to End Gender-Based Violence this past month. 
The plan is a historic milestone in fulfilling a long-standing commitment of all levels of government to work together towards an Ontario and Canada free of gender-based violence. Mr. Speaker, the five pillars of the National Action Plan are, one, support for victims, survivors and their families, two, prevention, three, responsive justice systems, four, implementing Indigenous-led approaches, and five, a social infrastructure and enabling environment. Ontario, we led the, for the approach in forwarding the Order. National Action Plan to the FPT Forum Justice Order. Ministers with a written request that they commit to taking further action to improve response. justice system responses, including by holding perpetrators and offenders accountable. Mr. Speaker, safety is a right, not a privilege. And during the negotiations with the federal government, we will work hard to reinforce this as we work towards a fair and equitable approach that will address violence against women across. Thank you. <laughs> Member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In my writing, the Mayor of Fort Erie, Wayne Redekop, said Bill 23 will significantly benefit developers with no guarantee it will lead to lower housing prices. The Town of Niagara Lake has said Bill 23 could le lead to the loss of important cultural heritage resources. In the writing of Niagara West, the Town of Pelham voiced concerns. The Town of Lincoln Mayor said amendments to these acts will change how we fund the services and programs our community members expect from us. Speaker, that means the PCs are forcing municipalities to raise taxes. The Town of Grimsby, the Town of Grimsby outright rejected Bill 23. Speaker, why are the Premier and MPP from Niagara West ignoring concerns of Niagara Regional Municipalities elected officials? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, uh, our proposed legislation has received strong support. And I'm going to give one example on the record for the member. Niagara Regional Chair Jim Bradley said, and I again quote, I applaud the province for considering all options at their disposal to address the crisis, this crisis, including exploration of expansion of so-called strong mayor powers. And that, quote, as regional chair, I look forward to working with the provincial facilitators to find ways to better support our growing population while addressing the housing crisis. That's the quote. Speaker, it's partners like Jim Bradley, who have a long experience in both municipal and Order. provincial politics in Ontario, that will help our government shape our next steps. The next oh, supplementary question, member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Markham's mayor and councillors began their new term at council in a special meeting to unanimously reject Bill 23. This is the government house leader's writing. City staff presented a report showing that the changes in Bill 23 could cost the city $136 million in annual revenue, requiring an increase of 50 to 80 percent on property taxes to maintain existing service levels, equaling an estimated $600 to $1,000 a year to the average taxpayer. Speaker, why does the Premier choose to subsidize developer profits by increasing the taxes of the people of Markham? Member for Niagara West will come to order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. Speaker, the, the numbers the member is uh, professing don't add up. You know, uh, while the Association of Municipalities of Ontario estimates that Bill 23 will result in $5.1 billion in lost revenue over a nine year span, municipalities earned $1.02 billion in investment income and interest earnings from reserve fund surpluses in 2020 alone. That amounts to double the estimated revenue loss. The members opposite, especially this member, who doesn't support his chair, uh, Jim Bradley in Niagara, has to make sure that if they're going to talk numbers, they've got to talk Order. numbers that are correct. We're going to move forward and we're going to have some audits to ensure that the numbers that are being bounced around by our municipal partners are verified. Yeah, yeah. Next question, the member from First Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario's provincial parks attract local, national and international visitors. The natural environment found at each of our parks reflects each region's beauty, uniqueness and diversity. 
With so much to offer, it's not surprising that Ontario's provincial parks are experiencing growing numbers and visitors are eager to take advantage of our parks and to spend time with their friends and family. And I know my friends and family enjoy spending time at our provincial parks as well, Speaker. Visitors can spend their day camping, hiking, canoeing, or just relaxing in a wide range of activities and programs at over 330 locations across Ontario. Speaker, can the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks tell us how our government is supporting Ontario's park system? The Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Perth Wellington for that great question. Looking forward uh, to joining you in your riding next week. Uh, Speaker, I think uh, everyone here in the chamber can agree we all love Ontario parks and we all love uh, getting outdoors. As a, as a lover of nature, I know firsthand the value of having such an extensive park system in the province of Ontario. In fact, a park system we're expanding. I reflect fondly on the recent announcement to add Alfred Bogg uh, to this incredible system, preserving over 3,000 acres and protecting uh, peat moss, one of the most important uh, sources to sequester carbon. A speaker, Ontario Parks attracted over 800,000 visitors last year, and this government's making investments. In fact, since 2018 alone, this government has invested over $50 million back into Ontario's park system. These are ensuring that Ontarians are having the best possible, possible visitor experience, and we're not Response. done there, Speaker, and I look forward to expanding on the great work in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's great to hear that our government recognizes the importance of keeping our parks vibrant and welcoming to visitors. The Ontario Park System is the province's largest outdoor recreation provider, offering a wide range of activities and opportunities. When our parks and facilities are well maintained, our guests are better served and making their stay all the more enjoyable. Speaker, can the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks Please elaborate on what specific investments our government has made to update and improve Ontario's provincial parks. Minister of the Environment. Speaker, and I again appreciate the question from the member opposite. You know, Speaker, when, uh, when I became Minister of Environment, I reflected that a previous government, they had no online store. There was no way to generate revenue from those parks visitors that demanded and wanted things like hoodies or the popular crests, and I see the member from Oshawa looking. I know she's a crest lover as well. We wanted those crests, and online you can now buy them. And in fact, Speaker, what's exciting is that revenue that we now generate online is going 100% of it is going right back into provincial parks. The only answer the Liberals had was to, in, to tax people. Um, Speaker, what's exciting in the winter months? Arrowhead skating, and I know members really in, enjoy that. In Sandbank, Speaker, we're, we've invested over 5.6 million in new campgrounds alone, and I know uh, our Minister of Energy is excited with that. Spons. We've also upgraded staffing facilities and built new ones so that the great employees can continue doing the great work. We're the number one employee for students in the summer, Speaker. So I encourage everyone get out to the parks. And Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker to the Minister of Municipal, Municipal Affairs and Housing. It's a dark day for democracy in Ontario. In less than an hour, the Conservative MPPs are expected to vote on Bill 39 Porter. that will end majority vote democracy in Ontario municipalities. It will override the voices Porter. of their elected representatives, including Tom, Mayor Tom Maracas of Aurora, who has condemned the government's plans to pave over the Green Belts. Order. In the North Region, the Minister will be appointing a regional chair who, with one-third of council votes, will be able to override majority votes. Now, I know the Minister has been blaming the Liberals, attacking the NDP, or pivoting to housing when asked about democratic questions, but we can build housing while respecting democratic rights. Will the Minister be voting to end majority vote, demo majority vote democracy in York Region today? Minister, you know, Minister, you know, Speaker, I, you know I, I just that that member's speech and speech last night just made me think of uh, something that we're fighting for. You know, there's thousands of workers building these homes, laborers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, all union workers. Good jobs with pensions and benefits. Speaker, the NDP is no friend 
of the working class families yeah. who are looking to get their home. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. what we're Opposition fighting come for. To order. We're fighting for young people, we're fighting for workers, we're working for workers, and we want to make sure that those good jobs with bigger Order. paychecks are part of our housing supply action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supplementary question. Mr. Mi to the minister, I actually am paid my way through a lot of my life doing carpentry work and i can tell you what people every carpenter Order. every construction worker that i worked with they Order. wanted above and above everything else they wanted the democratic rights of ontarians to be respected york regional councillors asked the government not to give a government side come to order gift to developers because it will mean that the taxes will go up in King Vaughan. And my question is to the Minister of Education. These councillors were elected by the people in York Region, but soon their power to represent their constituents will be overridden by Bill 39 that imposes minority rule in York Region. Will the Minister of Education be undermining the democratic rights of the residents of York Region by voting on the undemocratic Bill 39 today? Mr. Oh. Again, speak, another Toronto member uh, speaking against uh, you know, John Tory and the tools that John Tory needs to get shovels in the ground fast. We support Mayor Tory. He's a great mayor, yep. and, and, he, and he wants to do his share to get shovels in the ground faster. A position That's come why we, we listen to his worship and, and put those measures to add those tools uh, to, to ensure that the strong mayor powers get that shovels in the ground, make, make those uh, important investments in, in our community. You know, the NDP, again, uh, despite even their own advisors, even their own advisor uh, to their new leader, uh, the NDP continue to block the dream of home ownership. We had young people in the, in the galleries earlier today. Those young people, we're fighting for them. We want to ensure that they, they have a dream. Uh, to ensure that they have a home that meets their needs in their budget. We're fighting for seniors to yeah, ensure yeah. that they have the opportunity to downsize, and we're fighting for new Canadians who we welcome to our community. The people. We yeah, want to make response. sure that we have a home that, that, that fits them as they come and live in the best place to live, work, and raise Ontario, their family. Yeah, yeah. Ontario. Next question, the member for Markham Unionville. The speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. People in my writing are worried about increasing reports of gun violence occurring in communities across the GTA. They fear for the safety of their loved ones as reports of violent crimes are on the rise. Just last weekend, a 21-year-old woman was shot and killed at a, gun sta at a gas station in Mississauga. At the same time, Hamilton endures its fourth shooting in a week and the 40th for the entire year. Increasing violence and crime is a serious matter that impacts the safety and security of all Ontarians. Speaker, can the Solicitor General explain what our government, working in partnership with police services across Ontario, is doing to keep us safe from smuggled gun crime. Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my friend from Markham Unionville for his question. It's an important question. On Monday of this week, the Toronto Police Service made an exceptional announcement dealing with smuggled guns. Toronto Police Service has seized an unprecedented 62 illegal firearms destined for the hands of criminals. This seizure shocked the most seasoned investigators. I want to thank everyone from the Toronto Organized Crime Enforcement Unit, including Superintendent Steve Watts. All but one of the guns, all but one of the guns that traced were seized illegally and smuggled from the U.S. And together with our federal partners, Ontario has invested $203 million as part of our guns, gangs, and violence reduction strategy. Our program is focused on early intervention in at-risk communities. Monsieur le Président, retirez les armes à feu illégal du... Mr. Speaker, we are taking illegal guns off our streets. It's our priority. Speaker. Thank you to the Solicitor General for his response. The work carried out each and every day by all members of our province's 
police services is commendable and appreciated. The magnitude of the, mem of the number of weapons seized by the police officers as part of Project Barbell is both concerning and disturbing. Toronto Police Chief Rammer said, the best, it, it best that the gun violence continue to be the most significant public safety concern as shootings devastate families and erode our sense of security. During his press conference, Police Chief Rammer further stated that the majority of the guns seized as part of his operation originated from the United States and that additional measures at our borders are required. Speaker, through you to the Solicitor General, how is our government addressing this issue as we move forward? Great question. Mr. General. Mr. President, je Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague for his question. It's an excellent one. Mr. Speaker, I'm serious. It is an honor to ensure our province's security. Police services about tightening the screening at our borders to stop the flow of illegal guns coming into our streets. And we agree with them. I've seen it for myself in Niagara, in Sault Ste. Marie in Sarnia Lambton, and we know the only way to tackle gun violence is to crack down on illegal guns that are being smuggled in our borders every day. And that's why I raise this issue with Minister Mendicino in every one of our calls, and I will not stop. Monsieur le Président, nous Mr. Speaker, we work with all organization, law enforcement organizations to ensure Ontario's security. Next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. On Friday, massive demonstrations at Western University will call on the government to stop auctioning off the Greenbelt. My constituent Brendan writes, Bill 23 threatens raising our taxes, worsening the housing crisis, privately trading our biodiversity and farmland for industry donations and favours. Main Street Research CEO Quido Maggi said, there's a perception that someone is unfairly lining their pockets. The perception is that the Ford government is unfairly giving a benefit to a small sliver of their supporters. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. I withdraw. Will the Premier listen and again admit, I've heard it loud and clear, people don't want me touching the green belt? And the government has to. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, I. You know what? It, it's, it's no surprise that the, the members opposite don't support the people who build homes because they don't want people to actually own homes. Mr. Speaker, they talk about affordable housing, but they vote against the fact that we brought in a bill that brought the highest affordable housing, rental housing in the provinces in over 30 years. Voted against that. They talk about affordable housing, but they voted against 60,000 seniors having new and upgraded long-term care beds. Those are, what are those colleagues? Those are homes for seniors. They vote against it, Mr. Speaker. So they talk out of both sides of their mouth, Mr. Speaker. I and ask him to withdraw. Allowed either. I withdraw. So they, they talk. They, they allowed. Conclude your answer. Yeah. What I said, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for clarifying. So, so listen, Mr. Speaker. It should be no surprise to anybody that the members opposite don't support people who build homes. Don't support the people who want to buy homes. Don't support the new Canadians that want Response. to live in a province and have the dream of home ownership. This has been the NDP since their inception and why they always form a small sliver in this. That concludes our question period for this morning. Member for Waterloo has